All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and go to Nehemiah chapter number three. Did get to spend two weeks at camp, and I love, I love Camp Yes. And when I say Camp Yes, I mean Camp Yes BC. <laughs> I've, I've, begun, I've become to uh, appreciate Camp Yes here in British Columbia. And I just want to take a moment and tell the teenagers that every decision you make, whether you think it's small or whether you think it's larger, they're all very important. And I made two decisions at camp. The first one seemed small. I decided that I wouldn't cheat at school anymore. I, was, I can't remember if I was junior week or teen week, but I was struggling with trying to take shortcuts and trying to, uh, trying to cheat. And so I went out and I bawled my eyes out, and I don't even know who the counselor that prayed with me. I couldn't even think of his name. I can't even think of his face. But uh, I, I prayed and asked the Lord to forgive me of that, and I got to go home, and I never did it again. And I can only give the, the glory to the Lord because I think if I didn't make that small, kind of smaller decision to not take shortcuts and try to do things behind, uh, you know, be sneaky and cheat like that, I wonder where I would have ended up. So every decision is important. The second decision I made was I surrendered to preach in 2003. And uh, because of that, I value the time that teenagers get to spend at camp. And it's a powerful, wonderful ministry, and I'm just thankful to be able to have a part. And maybe even if it's that counselor that no, that no one even remembers their face, I'm just thankful that I can be there and have, and have a part. In Nehemiah chapter number three, I didn't know what the teenagers were going to be giving a testimony, so I feel kind of bad because I actually have two sermons in one tonight. It's a, you know, you get a two for one. So, uh, d- you know, double the sermon for one price, and uh, sounds like a good deal, right? So, uh, but you'll, you'll understand what I mean when we start uh, diving, into, uh, diving into this. Now, Nehemiah had returned to Jerusalem under the, the direction of the Lord, the call of God. Uh, there had been, the remnant had already returned, led by Zerubbabel, and then uh, God used Ezra to begin to um, set up the correct worship again in the temple that had been built. But here we see Nehemiah under the direction of God. He returns to Jerusalem, and, and he begins to lead the people in rebuilding the wall. His heart had been broken. God had given him a great burden. And he returns as the leader and begins to undertake this uh, giant task of rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And, and I, love, I love this chapter. In fact, Nehemiah is one of my favorite books. I think as a, as a preacher, I love the leadership qualities that I see in, in Nehemiah and the way that he led uh, the people in this amazing product, uh, an amazing uh, building project. It does remind me a lot of times of the local church and how God gives each local church leaders and, and pastors to uh, help lead the local assembly, the body of believers, in the great project that we have in, of course, furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of us, like Nehemiah and those that were involved in the building of the wall, they really, it reminds me of today, this project that uh, God has given us to be a part of his, uh, his church and our local churches as members of the body. And each member having a job, each member having a different responsibility and uh, a, a different, even sometimes maybe a different type of level of responsibility. And tonight I think we'll see a lot in, in the people here that had a part in the building of the wall. We'll, we'll be able to draw a lot of parallels, I think, to us today uh, as part of the local church here in Vancouver. So let's bring, uh, let's bring uh, starting in chapter number one, uh, uh, chapter number three, verse number one, sorry. And you will have to forgive me. There are a lot of names in this chapter, and uh, I probably won't pronounce them all right, but I will do my best to, to do them, all right? Ne- Nehemiah chapter three, verse one. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests, and they builded the sheep gate, they sanctified it, and set it up on the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it unto the tower of Henaniel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho. And next unto them builded Zachur, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Miramoth, the son of uh, uh, Urijah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, see, there you go, all these names, the son of Mezhazabil, 
If you ever need a name, you can just go through this chapter and you can find some. And next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Benai. And next unto them, uh, and next unto them the Tekoites repaired, and their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Pesai, and Meshulam, the son of Bezodia. I don't know. I'm doing my best. They laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired uh, Miltiah, the Gibeonite, and Jaden, the Maranathite, the men of Gibeon, and Mizpah, unto the throne of the governor of this side of the river. Next unto him repaired uh, uh, Uziel, the son of Hariah, of the goldsmiths. Next unto him also repaired Hananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries, and they fortified Jerusalem unto the broad wall. Next unto them repaired Rephiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. And next unto them repaired Jediah, the son of Haramath, I like that one, even or against his house. And next unto him repaired Hattush, the son of Hashbaniah. And Malchiah, Malchich, I don't know, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired the other piece in the tower of the furnaces. And next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Halo Hesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. The valley gate repaired Hanan and the inhabitants of Zenoia. They built it and set up the doors thereof and locks thereof and the bars thereof and the thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. But the dung gate repaired Malachiah, uh, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Bechakarim. He built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalun, the son of Koholze, the ruler of part of Mizpah, and he built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Silo by the king's garden, and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, the ruler of the half part of Bethur, unto the place over against the sepulchres of David, and to the pool that was made, and unto the house of the mighty. After him repaired the Levites, Rehum, the son of Benai. Next unto him repaired Hashabiah, the ruler of the half part of Hila, in his part. After him repaired their brethren, Bavai, the son of Henadad, the ruler of the half part of Kila. And next to him repaired Ezer, the, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah, another piece over against the going to the army at the turning of the wall. After him Baruch, the son of Zabai earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall unto the door of the house of Elishib, the high priest. After him repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz, another piece from the door of the house of Eliashib, even to the end of the house of Eliashib. And after him repaired the priest, the men of the plain. After him repaired Benjamin and Heshub over against their house. After him repaired Azariah, the son of uh, Messiah, the son of Ananiah, by his house. After him repaired Bainu, the son of Henadad, another piece from the house of Azariah, uh, unto the turning of the wall, even unto the corner. Palal, the son of uh, Uzzah, over against the turning of the wall and the tower which lieth out from the king's high house that was by the court of the prison. After him, Padiah, the son of Parosh. Moreover, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel unto the place over against the water gate toward the east and the tower that lieth out. After them, the Tzkoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lieth out, even unto the wall of Ophel. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, everyone over against his house. After them repaired Zodak, the son of Immer, over against his house. After him repaired also Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. After him repaired Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaf, another piece. After him repaired Meshulam, the son of Barachai, over against his chamber. After him repaired Malaka, Mal, uh, Malchiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of Nethanims, and of the merchants, over against the, the gate of Mifkad, and to the going up of the corner. And between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate, repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. That's a long list. It's a long list. When you think about this building project, you can begin to imagine and understand the scope of what was involved. I want you to see here, first of all, the wall. 
The wall was a massive undertaking. You might ask yourself, why give us all of this information? Why give us all these names, uh, the parts of the wall? You know, why all of this information? I mean, we read it and we can barely comprehend all of it unless we take the time to really study it out. But I think it's important, and we'll see that here tonight. In the building of the wall, we see many gates that are mentioned. And today, uh, tonight, I want us to see that um, this information is not given to us just to fill up more pages of the Word of God. And these gates themselves give us pictures that we can see in the lives of, uh, in the lives of everyday uh, Christianity, in the, lives, in the lives of everyday being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now bear with me. Jerusalem's walls at this time would be approximately 1.5 square miles. In Canadian, about 3 kilometers. And a wall would be about 12 feet high. A huge undertaking, to say the least. Without all, the, you know, without all of the, the tools and the ability to build today, uh, they would have to undertake and build this large wall, uh, this 12-foot high wall, over th- almost 3 kilometers long, without the equipment and towers and you know, all the things that we can see today. The first wall took over 90 years to build. This wall, under the leadership of Nehemiah, would be built in just a period of 52 days. It's an amazing construction project. Being in construction myself for many years, uh, I love seeing a, a well-oiled machine in work. I love seeing a crew working together in unity to accomplish an enormous task. I remember I was in charge of putting a new roof on a Canadian tire in uh, in Richmond. And I can remember getting up on that roof and it felt like it went on for miles, you know, it's just forever roof. But I remember thinking when I got the whole crew together and we began to work and everybody knew their job and everyone did their part, I remember thinking how quickly we were able to knock off section and section of that roof to be able to complete the entire project in just a matter of weeks. It's just amazing to see a group of people get together to accomplish the same task. And all the names we read represent different people from different places, from different backgrounds, that gathered together to complete one project. And it reminds me of the church. How that God gathers us and places us together and many of us are from different towns and different places and different backgrounds and we have, uh, you know, different experiences, different professions, different jobs. And yet when it works, the church works together in unity, the church can accomplish some great things. And I think we'll see ourselves here tonight in the building of the wall. And there's many people that were mentioned in the wall, and I think that we might see ourselves in some some of them here tonight. As we think about the wall, I can't help but first of all think about the gates. And so uh, the second point tonight is the gates. Before we get into looking at the the people, and and, uh, and we'll kind of see, uh, go through some of these people as we go through the gates, but I want you to see here, that all of this information is given to us, and there's some amazing pictures that we can see in the gates. In verse number one of our text, the very first verse we're given is the sheep gate. The sheep gate. Now, the sheep gate here was going to be rebuilt by the priests. It makes sense because the sheep gate was used for the entrance of the sheep. The sheep would uh, gather here and they'd bring them here. And the the purpose of this gate was to bring in the sheep for the sacrifice at the temple. And these sheep will be brought in and be prepared to be sacrificed uh, in the temple and be prepared to be used for the blood offerings. It's amazing. As I began to look at the sheep gate, uh, I began to study it out and it's believed that many times, if not most of the time, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he would enter into Jerusalem from the Sheep Gate. Except for the tri- triumphal entry where he entered in through the Eastern Gate, we see here that uh, Jesus himself would enter into through the Sheep Gate. Really giving us a picture that Jesus was the sheep, the lamb, that would take away the sins of the world. And he would be shed, his blood would be shed 
for us. We can see the symbolism here and the picture in the sheep gate. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. He was called that by John the Baptist. And in fact, Philip, when he explained to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter number 8, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading from Isaiah, and it talked about the lamb that was led to the slaughter. And what did Philip do in Acts chapter 8? He began to preach unto the eunuch, Jesus. Jesus is the lamb that was to be slain, the sheep that was brought to the slaughter. And so it makes sense that the priests would build this part of the wall, the gate. It was the part to prepare the sheep for sacrifice. Again, I, I think of Nehemiah and his leadership. And I think, you know, to be able to place people in the, in, in the parts of the wall where they would have a personal stake in, involved. You know, the priests would be involved in building the sheep gate where the sheep would come in. It just, it makes sense as a leader to put people in places where they, where they can excel, you know, where they know that uh, when they begin to build, uh, they know that they can see what it'll be used for. They'll see what, uh, what is going to happen, and they'll be able to envision the project. I remember when I went to uh, Metro Baptist Church and Pastor Mackay there, he said, you know, I want you to, to do every part. You know, I want you to be involved in every part. And I very quickly learned what parts of the church I don't want to be a part of. <laughs> uh, now, I didn't go in the nursery, but I was pretty close. I taught a junior class. And I'll have to tell you, that was a trying time for me. I don't really enjoy teaching small children. You know, their intellect level is just not very, you know, it's not up there. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it's a different experience. Now, I'm thankful for the experience. But I remember thinking, if I got to do this for, for 20 or 30 years, uh, that's going to that's gonna be, be difficult for me. I'm not going to be, I don't think I'll be able to do that. But there are some people that would love that, would love to teach kids for, for 20 and 30 years. There are some people that when, when they get in there, you can tell they have the joy to begin to build because they, they enjoy it. It's, I think it's a gift that God gives people to do. And we see here we see the sheep gate and involved in, in, you know, building priests. Now, you know, when you think about priests, you really don't think of construction. But that's kind of the amazing thing of this project is many of the people, it wasn't their first occupation to be builders. Now, the priests would build the wall, to the, it says, to the Tower of, of the Hundred. To the, it was a military barracks, and then they would also build the wall to the Tower of Hinnanel. I did bring a, a graph, uh, if you want to put that up. It's not easy to see. I'm sorry. I wish, uh, you know, if you had bigger screens, you might be able to see. But uh, <laughs> uh, if, it's, it's not, uh, just so you know, this is a, a, a render, an artist rendering, all right? So we don't know exactly... Uh, you know, the exact diagram of, of Jerusalem. But uh, if you look at it, the north side is, is actually the side that you're looking to the left, all right? The south side is, is the part you're looking to. As I began to study it out, I noticed there wasn't really much of a south wall. And then I saw this picture and I realized, oh, that makes sense. There's really not much of a south. So if you imagine, if you flipped it up on a side, the northern side would be this side to your left, the, the other side. So you see this graph and you see we start at the sheep gate, which is, it, which is, if you look at it, it's the, to, it's the top left. You see there? The top left, the sheep gate. And the, the priests were a part of building that sheep gate. And then we see we move on to, after the sheep gate, we see the men of Jericho. The men of Jericho built this, uh, were next, and they built uh, next to the priests. And it makes sense because that was the road to Jericho. And so, again, I see... Uh, when I see Nehemiah, he, he was very wise. And, he, you know, uh, he, he would begin to put the men of Jericho on the, the road that would lead to Jericho. And it just, it, it was, you see the, the leadership of Nehemiah here. And so it made sense for these men of Jericho to build, uh, the build uh, this part of the wall. Next, we keep going, and we see in verse number three, we see the fish gate. Now, the Bible tells us the fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanai. And the fish gate was used to bring in the fish from the market, uh, you know, from the market uh, probably from the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. If you can imagine, this probably smelled quite strong in this area of the city. Um, I, I'm not much of a seafood eater. I don't like the smell of fish. And uh, so I probably wouldn't have liked this part of Jerusalem very much next to the fish gate. But we see here that this fish gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. Maybe they were fishers. We're not sure. But we do here, again, not only do we see the sheep gate represent something, but I think we see the fish gate. 
It instantly reminds you of a verse in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19 that uh, we are called to be fishers of men. You know, after we meet Jesus and we put our faith and trust in Christ, one of the first calls he gives us is to be fishers of men. And here we see this fish gate and the building take place. I see an individual here. His name is Merimoth, uh, the son of Uriah. Uh, Merimoth uh, continued in building the next section of the wall. Now, if you look back in the book of Ezra, you'll see that Merimoth um, had some problems in his family. He was a grandson of Kaz. Well, that family had a, pro- had a problem. They couldn't trace back their lineage and their genealogy to the, to the priests. And so because of that, in Ezra, it tells us they were put away from that job. They were no longer able to do the duties uh, that the high priests would do because, uh, because they couldn't prove their lineage. And it was, uh, you know, important that they were able to do that. And so they were put away from that. You know what I got thinking when I was reading this about Merrimoth and his family? I wonder how many times sometimes we are disappointed in our life because we don't get the job or we don't get the task that we think we ought to have. And uh, because of that, they weren't able to be involved in all of the priestly duties. But we see here that they pitched in where they could. They got involved in building uh, building the wall here. And they picked up the tools. And and we don't see them getting upset or getting, we don't see that bitterness. Now, maybe it was they were hurt. And maybe there was some hurt in that family. But they didn't stop them from serving the Lord. It, It didn't stop them in getting involved where they could. The next section was repaired by the men, the men of Tekoya, or the Tekoyites. Uh, in verse number 5, we can see that. Now, this was the hometown of Amos the prophet, a very small city. A very small city. But when the job came, even though they were small, maybe insignificant, they got involved. It reminds me that sometimes we can think that we can't make a difference. We, we think that, well, I don't have a lot to offer. I was reminded about that in one of the testimonies tonight. We can have this idea that what I have to offer won't do much. What I have to offer won't be able to accomplish much. But we see here that Koyets, they got involved, even though they were a small city with not a lot to offer. They got involved and were able to build a small section of the wall. Now, there's something kind of sad here. In verse number five, it tells us that their nobles refuse to work. Their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. What a sad testimony recorded for us in the word of God. If there was a chapter about Greater Vancouver Baptist Church, and it gave a list of all of the names of those that were involved in the body of Christ, and it gave your name, what would be written about you? It would be sad if your name would appear there and it would say, so-and-so, or whatever you put your name in there, they put not their necks to the work. I believe that uh, the, many, the reason why many churches struggle is because they're full of many people that don't put their necks to the work. They don't get involved. Now, I also think this speaks highly of the men, the, 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 the men of the city, because even though their leaders and their nobles didn't work, They got involved, and they got busy working. Sometimes I've seen people use leaders in their lives as excuses not to be about the the work of the Lord. I've seen maybe leaders that have failed them, leaders that have hurt them, leaders, you know, pastors and so on that have led them, and they haven't been everything that they thought they should be. And I've seen people use them as an excuse not to be about the work of the Lord. We continue on, and we see that the the men were able to be involved in the work of the Lord. We can see that this is not already, is not a project that can be done by just one group or one man. This was a project, and each of the colors there, I know you can't read them, but each of the colors there represents a different group that built part of the wall. And you can see all the different colors, all the different groups that got together to build this wall. And so we make our way past the, uh, you know, we, we finish past the, the northern wall. We make our way down to the western wall. We can see in verse number six, we can see what we call the old gate. Uh, in, in verse number six, it says, the old, the, moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada. Now, the old gate, I think, is important. This gate was 
uh, was part of the old city of Israel. It was rich in tradition. The gate's name probably was a nod to their ancient traditions. It was a nod to the past. It was a reminder of, uh, of where they had come from and what, uh, what God had done for them. You know, the, the Bible tells us that God is called the ancient of days. And sometimes we can think when something is old or when something is ancient, we can think that it's not relevant. But we know that God, of course, is always relevant. And uh, we, we, when we see this old gate, I think it gives us a reminder that we ought to appreciate and remember the times that have come before us. I'm reading a book right now. It's called Outsiders. Uh, it's, a, it's a book written and prepared for by Pastor Chapel, and uh, I've enjoyed reading it, reading through these people that have gone before, many of them who were burned at a stake and lost their lives because they stood on biblical truth. And I'm reminded that we should not forget uh, where we've come from. And just because something is old or just because something is known as a tradition doesn't mean that it's not relevant anymore. Sometimes I've seen it, uh, young, uh, young people have started throwing away a, a lot of things because, well, it's old, it's, it's ancient, it's, it's not relevant anymore. But the truth of the word of God is always relevant. God is always relevant, so we have to be very careful when, when we think about making changes uh, in our lives. It's a, re- it's a great reminder. And so they see this get built, was, this part of the wall was built by men and women from neighboring towns. I thought that was interesting because, you know, we, uh, you know, we often, we live in a day where, you know, gender equality and all this kind of stuff, when even in the building of the wall, there's lists of men and women who got involved. It wasn't just one gender that was, uh, that was represented. We can see here that uh, even women got involved in building. You know, that's great. Uh, I was reading an article today. Anyone hear about, uh, there's a world championship for Fortnite? I know that's, it's, it's a game or whatever, but I read an article how about everyone was upset because there wasn't enough women represented in the championship. And I said, that's because they're smarter, right? They're not going to waste their lives playing video games. Uh, that's they're smarter, you know? And so uh, anyways, uh, we see here the women, the women were getting involved in, in building the walls as well. We see here merchants were involved, traders were involved in securing uh, this part of the wall. Uh, Many of them would have had, of course, financial interest in making sure that their shops and making sure that everything that they had in life was protected uh, from 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 invaders and from thieves. Nehemiah was a wise leader who installed people in places where they would have had a a more of a vested interest. And it's human nature to do your best when you have some sort of personal stake involved. I think that's why it's important for us to take possession of, and to take ownership in the body of Christ that he has placed us in. You know, nothing thrills my heart more than when I hear someone say, I love Lionsgate Baptist Church. Because they've invested personally in the work of the Lord there. And when you invest personally in the work of the Lord, where you put, you, are, you will work harder. It's a, it's a natural response. And so I would encourage you, maybe uh, you need to invest yourself here in the work of the Lord. You need to think of this as your church and your place and say, I can be involved and I can do something for the work of the Lord here at Greater Vancouver Baptist Church. Next, we move on to verse number 13. We see the valley gate. The valley gate, of course, you know, I can't help but think of the picture uh, of how as a Christian we go through trials in life. And, and there, are, there are valleys in life, valley type experiences that the Lord uses for our, for our personal growth. It's never easy, but, as, but the Christian needs to remember that, uh, you know, there are mountaintops, which means that there are valleys. And of course, in our lives, there's going to be good times and, and difficult times. We see here, uh, Nehemiah, begin, is, again, he's, he's getting people to build and putting people to, in, in, in the work of the Lord, places really near their homes. I'm not going to go through and spell out that they were building all near their homes or the direction of their homes, but that uh, thought is continued here. The other thought came to my mind when I was studying this out is that uh, sometimes we can be trying to rebuild other areas, but if we would just be busy about rebuilding the area around us, then the work would be completed. 
You know, if, if every section here was, uh, if the, every section here was worried about the other section being completed, then their own section wouldn't be done. It wouldn't be completed. And we have to, we sometimes can be so worried about what other people are doing and we fail to do our own part. And if we would just get busy and working and rebuilding the area that we have been placed, you know, put in charge of, or the area that we have been placed in in the church, then we would begin to see the, the entire church function in a, in a proper, unified way. What if we just rebuilt around us? What if we spent time bringing people to Christ around us? What if we, uh, you know, wouldn't get so discouraged be, because the world, is, we can, the world is so big, but we just focus on the area in front of us? Sometimes I can think of, the entire city of North Vancouver, and I can think about how, you know, we're just a small church and we have a large city to reach, and I can get kind of overwhelmed, sometimes even discouraged, uh, that uh, we got such a large area to reach. And then I have to remember, we just need to start where we are and do what we can do. The valley gate opened up to the valley of Hinnom, and it was the gate that Nehemiah would have traveled out to inspect the walls of the city earlier in Nehemiah chapter 1 and, verse, and, chapter, one and chapter 2. The men here re, rebuilt a large part of the wall. The Bible tells us they rebuilt 1,000 cubits of wall length. The largest section completed by one particular group. They did 1,000 cubits, 500 yards or 1,500 feet. You can see that represented by the blue line there, the largest section. Uh, these, these men, they, they built a large section. But I was reminded that no matter how large the section was, that wall wouldn't have done any good if no one else did their part. And sometimes in our church, we can think, well, I don't have as big of a responsibility or I don't have as big of an area. You just need to focus on doing what God has put you in charge of. Your, your part in the church. And then we go up to the, the dung gate, verse number 14. If, there, if I didn't like the fish gate, I probably wouldn't like the dung gate very much either. <laughs> Wonder what part of the wall you're building. <laughs> it might not be the prettiest part, but it's an important part. Now, the dung gate would have been the place where rubbish was removed from the city. Outside the dung gate would have been a large area for burning and disposing of the trash and waste and among other things. The dung gate is a reminder how important it is that trash needs to be removed from our own lives. And God needs a clean vessel to be used for him. And daily in our lives we ought to be removing that which is not good for us. The teenagers made lots of decisions, and many of them were very good, very good decisions. Decisions like getting rid of certain things. Screen time, I heard tonight. <laughs> screen time. Sometimes the screen can bring in a lot of filth and garbage. We need to be careful about the things that we allow into our lives. We should be getting rid of them. The dung gate. And we see it, we come here to the eastern wall. We come up to verse number 15, the fountain gate. The fountain gate would have been near the pool of uh, Silo in verse number 15. This was the place where people would be clean before proceeding to the temple. A place where they would have their ceremonial bathing to, in order to be cleansed so that they could worship the Lord in the temple. Of course, I can't help when you think of the fountain. You can't help but think of how the, the, it speaks to us of the Holy Spirit of God, the living waters, the, the fountain that springs uh, inside, of our, inside of our lives. And really, the Holy Spirit is what empowers us to live our Christian life. And the fountain, the water, is what empowered the city to be able to live. It says that Shalom also repaired the pool of Siloam by the king's garden. Now, none of these, many of these areas are long since destroyed, difficult to see. Many of them, you can't see them. I got a great privilege to be able to go to Israel uh, just last year. 
It's an amazing experience. If you haven't gone, I would encourage you to try to do it. Um, but, you know, the walls we know that they're there now are not Nehemiah's walls. They're, they're different walls. But it just is amazing to, to go there and to see. And even today, there's, there's gates that are there. <laughs> and uh, I took a picture of Lionsgate because I thought that was, you know, pretty cool. Our church would like to see that. Even though we're not la- named after that Lionsgate, but I thought it was pretty neat. Well, when I went there and I saw the city and how it was laid out, I, I, I got to go to a place where they think one of the pools were and I got to look in there, and it was pretty hard to see because it's all been kind of knocked over. And, but, I'm, but I was really struck with how many pools there were all over the place. The mikveh, as they call it, place for ceremonial bathing. It is, of course, a reminder of the Holy Spirit and how we need the Holy Spirit to live through us and in us in order to have victory in this life. We see here that... Uh, not only do we see the fountain gate, but we see here a part where Nehemiah is mentioned repairing the wall, verse number 16. And a leader not only goes the way, but he shows the way. And I was reminded of that with Nehemiah, because if, if he is going to be a leader, he didn't just say, well, you know, all right, let's get busy and stand back and not get involved. He, he got involved, and he joined alongside and began to build the walls as well. The next several sections were rebuilt by the Levites in verses 17 through 21. And here I see Nehemiah, he takes great pride in naming some people here. For instance, Baruch was named as one who earnestly repaired. Earnestly repaired. What does that mean? Well, he had some extra passion, (laughs) some extra zeal in his repairing. I don't know if that meant that he did a lot more than everybody else, probably. If he was uh, willing to put in longer hours or, you know, during the time that he was working, he exerted himself a lot more than others. But Nehemiah took notice. I mean, it probably helps that he was working next to uh, Baruch. But, you know, he saw what, what he was doing. He said he earnestly repaired. I know as a pastor, I appreciate members that earnestly work. I have a few. That no matter when the doors are open, no matter what opportunities or outreach we're doing, they're there. I know they'll be there. I can count on them. And I know they'll do their best. They earnestly repair. I wonder if the chapter was written about Greater Vancouver Baptist Church, would there be some earnest repairers mentioned about in that chapter. The priests uh, in neighboring towns, in verse 22, they came to help. Uh, citizens came to help. We see that everyone and anyone that was willing to work, worked. We see here in verse number 26, we see the water gate. This gate led down to the Gihon Spring. is where the water was brought, brought in. Later on in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah would... Um, would get up in verse number one and he would take the, the, take the word of God, the book of the law of Moses, and he would begin to speak to the people from the book of the law of Moses, from the word of God here at the water gate. That's the other mention. You know, the water gate is unique in that it doesn't tell us that it had to be repaired. If you go through the whole chapter, you see all the other gates. They had to put the hinges and the doors and, the, and all of that. But the water gate, it appears as though that there wasn't, a lot of work wasn't needed to be built. You know, a lot of the gate didn't need to be built. Of course, Nehemiah took the word of God and preached here in Nehemiah chapter 8. But I think hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, I think the water gate is a symbol or a picture of the word of God. It stands the test of time. And uh, we see that here. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 3 says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And And how so much we need in our lives and in this church, we need the work of the Holy Spirit and we need the word of God. It's no coincidence this gate was located next to the fountain gate and they often go go together. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the word of God alive to us personally, allowing cleansing, encouragement, and direction to take place. The, the fountain gate, the water gate, we see num- verse number 28, the horse gate. There's 10 gates, so I know there's a lot of gates tonight. 
But we're, we're, getting, we're working our way through them. The horse gate in verse number 20, uh, 28, the wall continued. It was built to the horse gate. The gate was close to the king's stables. It provided access for the soldiers. And the men of Jerusalem would ride their horses out of this gate to war. Again, we see that there was many people involved in building this gate. And, you know, they had to be ready at all times to fight. They had to be ready at all times to be able to defend the city of Jerusalem if it were under attack. And it's a reminder, it's a picture that we as Christians are in a battle, a spiritual warfare. And we have to be ready at all times to fight. And we see in verse number 29, we go to the east gate. The east gate is... It's one of my favorites. The east gate was the entrance to the temple. It was opposite of the Mount of Olives. We can see that in verse number 29. It was the first gate of Jerusalem that would be opened every morning. Ezekiel prophesied that Christ would return, would descend, we can see in Zechariah, to the Mount of Olives, and that he would enter through the eastern gate into Jerusalem at his second return. Ezekiel also prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 44 that the eastern gate would be sealed up until Christ would come. One of my favorite places in in Israel was standing on top of the Mount of Olives and looking out over the city of Jerusalem. And there this large, I know it's not the same walls as Nehemiah, but there this large gate, the eastern gate, sealed up since the 1500s. Sealed up because it had direct access to the Temple Mount. It's a reminder that we as Christians need to live each day expecting the Lord's return. I think this is an area that we often fail in. We get so distracted by everything that life has to offer that maybe even deep down there's a part of us that doesn't want him to return. But we are to live each day expecting his return. I know as I read the news and the media each day I think, man... I can't wait till the Lord returns because this world is getting out of control. Shootings and all sorts of things that just happened last night and today, El Paso and Dayton, Ohio. Just what's going on downtown right now this, this weekend. I remember I was preaching this morning and there I looked over, we could see a bus stop and there were several people there all dressed up, ready to go downtown. And I thought, what is the world coming to please Lord return do we live expecting his return ready for him to return and then we go into verse number 31 the the inspection gate now in verse 31 it doesn't use the word inspection it uses uh, it uses the gate mifkad the word translated is it's like inspection the inspection gate it's through tradition that it's believed that David would inspect his troops here and it would be a place where near the horse gate where the armies would gather and inspection would take place and training would take place and so on. But this gate reminds us that after this life is over, there will be an examination of the lives that we live. That each one of us will ultimately stand at the beam of seat of Christ 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, where we will be inspected and and we will be rewarded appropriately. Whether or not those things will last will be up to the decisions and the choices that we make in our lives. Will we invest in our treasure here on earth or will we invest in heaven? Will we earnestly work hard for the Lord or will we earnestly work hard for ourselves? The effort... This wall, it eventually wraps back in verse, the, the last verse of the chapter, verse 32, and it comes back to the sheep gate. The sheep gate, of course, we know that our lives and really our, our walk with the Lord, it begins at the sheep gate and it ends at the sheep gate. It begins and ends with Christ. It's a long wall. There's a lot of gates. We see some pictures, but I want to close with the last thought today, the people. The people. Did you notice all the different types of people mentioned? There were traders, apothecaries, perfumers, 
priests, Levites, Nethanims, town folks, nobles, small towns, big towns. You go through the list, there are, there are so many different people here named in this chapter. Why were they all named? Because every single one of them mattered to the Lord. Every single one of them mattered to God. And every single one here tonight matters to God. The work that you do, the, part, the work of the Lord that you're involved in, it matters to him. There was no one that, there was no, uh, one that didn't get involved except for maybe the nobles of the Tekoites, or however you say that name properly, I don't know. But they, they all got involved. And they worked hard, and they were able to build the wall in 52 days. What an example of a a leader in Nehemiah and a people that followed him as he followed God. It's an amazing example of what can be accomplished when God's people work together under godly leadership. So let me ask you tonight, which person are you? Which one of those people reminded you of you? You might think you don't have a lot to offer, but you can do something for him. You might have been hurt in the past, but that is no reason not to get involved today. Your leaders might have let you down at one time in your life, but that's no reason to not be involved in the work of the Lord. You can go through the list of people. There were those that worked hard, those that accomplished a lot for God. There were those that, were, that worked earnestly. They were passionate. They had zeal for God. If the chapter was written about Greater Vancouver, where would you be in that list? That's why this chapter and these events are so important. Nehemiah mentions every name because each person is important to God. Every one of these people had a purpose to fulfill God's work. And so do we in the work of God. The greatest accomplishments happen when a church can be unified. We too are supposed to have this unity in Christ in the local assembly of believers, the church. It is amazing what can be accomplished when we would gather together for the cause of Christ, when we would have a unity of purpose, that we would do what God has given us to do, fulfill our purpose, the united effort can far exceed the individual part. See, in North Vancouver, I have, there's a city that needs to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I need help from Lionsgate Baptist Church. And I preach that often. We all need to get involved. We all need to work. And we can do far more together than we can do apart. In Greater Vancouver Baptist Church, you can do far more together, unified under the godly leadership that he has provided you, than you can do apart. If you're not involved, would you get involved? Would you pick up a shovel? And even if it's a small part, would you get involved and do the work? If you're not working very hard, maybe it's time to change our work ethic and be an earnest worker for the Lord. Maybe we've had some failures in the past, and we're using that as an excuse not to be fully committed maybe we need to say you know what just because I've had those failures it's not an excuse not to be involved in the work of the Lord if you're a dedicated committed follower of Christ and member here at Greater Vancouver I want to commend you and I want to encourage you don't give up Christ is coming soon and there is only more to do 